So the power of the brain. The reason I chose this topic is because the, this week's parsha is called Parashat Naso. Naso is lift up. Naso et rosh, lift up the head. Basically, it speaks Naso et rosh neitel. That it's also from the word counting that they had to count the Eden, and um, oh. and it's just about you know whoever is uh, maybe it'll be good girls if you mute yourself because we can hear background noise. We know that there is such a thing in Hebrew in Torah. I'll call pshaim techase ahava. Hello, Jan. I'll call pshaim techase ahava means that. When we are basically people, when we do something wrong, because we love ourselves, you know, love is blind. So it's okay, it's my child, it's my spouse, it's me, I didn't mean to. Oh, when somebody else will do the same wrong thing, we get really upset. But if I did it, if my family did it, if my good friend did it, I'm not as upset and I'm trying to find excuses. If we go with Moach, Shalit alalev, the head governs, the brain governs the body. And then we're thinking about it. We're not going with emotions. When I go with emotions, then I'm biased. It's me, it's okay if I did it. It's my child, it's okay if he did it, if she did it. Somebody else will get upset. But if we go with our, right. But if we go with our, thank you, with our head, with our thinking, with our brain, then we can analyze and we we'll say, one minute, this and this was done. Is it the right thing or not the right thing? I try to take away my emotions from it. It doesn't matter who did it. If, I, if somebody has done something like this, is it acceptable or not? Because when I think, oh, my child did it, oh, it's okay, I'm finding reasons. So I shouldn't do that. I have to think with my head and think about the particular thing itself. And if it wasn't the right thing to do, then I have to see how we can stop it. Teach them, explain to them, explain myself to whoever else. Basically, as you know, what I'm trying to say that the brain governs the power of the brain, that we have to be able to distinguish what's right, what's wrong, and not to go. Obviously, emotions are very important, but the emotions have to follow the brain. Moach, the brain, shalit, is governing halev on the body and not the other way around. If it's the other way around and we don't think just with emotions, many times our emotions are okay. And many times our emotions can teach us, can lead us, can persuade us to do things that are not necessarily right. As we know, when we have um, mercy and compassion not in the right time, not to the right people, I cannot have compassion to somebody, God forbid, who is a murderer, somebody who is a Nazi, somebody who is a terrorist. Oh, I feel bad to hurt them. I don't want to this. And, and then what happens? Then the shoulders get, get, get shot and has and shalom die because we don't know how to protect ourselves because we are trying to protect people who are trying to hurt us. If somebody is trying to hurt me, I have to defend myself. And I have to make sure that I'm okay and I'm safe and so on. And, and, and the other fellow Jews are safe and the other fellow people are safe. Um, when we know what is wrong, that already helps so much. Which means when somebody is not feeling well, God forbid, if they don't know what's wrong with them, it's bad. When they know what's wrong with them, it's also bad, but at least they know how to cure it. So when we know what is wrong, that's why I have to go with our head, and I know I have to repair this and this, then I'm going to repair it. I want to share with you a story that I read, a true story that happened in Israel, that shows the strength that we have with the power of thinking, thinking positive. And I know many times we mentioned that it comes from the Yiddish saying, Think positive, think good, be happy, and it will be good. Because just the positive thinking adds lots of uh, godliness, lots of love, lots of happiness, lots of good powers that Hashem is going to save us. This parsha also speaks about the Birkat Kohanim, the Brach of the Kohanim, 
השם וישמרך. השם will bless you, השם will guard you, יאר השם פניו אליך, השם will shine his face to you, and all those beautiful blessings. So I would like to, um, I have a, a book that has a lot of stories um, from the Rebbe, from other Hasidim that have to do something with the Parsha. So I, I started reading it and I wanted to share with you. Really, really beautiful. At the blessing of the coin, it says, Ve'yishmerecha, Hashem will guard you. Rashi, the commentary Rashi explains, Ve'yishmerecha means that um, robbers, thieves, should not come and take away your money, God forbid. So Rabbi Ephraim Lev is saying the following story. He heard the story from the hero himself, from the person it happened with. They were in a, in a shul in Paris. The story happened in Paris. And they used to go to David in the shul that is called the Rashi shul. The shul, Rashi shul in Paris. And there was a, a weekly class that was given every day. And um, a rabbi used to give it, a Chabad rabbi used to give it. And um, they used to stay usually late in the evening. And it was very, very nice because the people that would come to the class were all businessmen, doctors, lawyers, business people, uh, financial advisors that work during the day, but they wanted to learn Torah, obviously. So they would come in the evening and they would come to the class and listen to the rabbi doing the, um, giving the class and, and learn. And they used to stay many times late. And these stories about the person that was the Gaba, he was like in charge of the shul to clean, to organize, to close the doors, to open the doors. So he would stay till the end of the class. And then he would close the door of the shul and go home. And it happened one evening, it was, I guess, perhaps winter, and it was already dark. And the last person of the class left home. So the guy decided he closed the, um, you know, closed everything closed. It started going in the street towards his vehicle. And all of a sudden, as he's going, all of a sudden, two, and there was nobody in the street, two big guys, tall, very dark skin, ran over to him and they told him, give us money. So he understood that he better save himself. He took out his wallet and unfortunately he had no cash in his wallet, no euros, it was in France. They started hitting him and he said, please, I don't have any money. You want, I can go to the ATM machine to my bank and I'm gonna take my card and I'm gonna take out money. He wanted to save himself. Obviously, that's what he had to do. There was nobody there to help. There were two guys, tall and big, and he couldn't fight with them physically. So they became very um, angry and they started hitting him again. And he said, please, let's go and I'll, I'll give you money. And then you will be able to go. So the three people went in the car, you know, those gangsters took him. And um, the Jewish man stayed in the car with one of the guys and the other guy decided to go and take out the money. Obviously they kept him in the car as it is and I guess he gave them his, all his, you know, um, uh, passwords and so on. As they were going, as that guy was going out of the car, was a lot of, uh, you know, commotion in the car. The hat, there was a casket, you know, like on, on the top of the, on the Jewish guy, it fell off and uh, they were able to see, the two robbers were able to see that he's a Jewish man. They didn't know before he was Jewish. They just were sitting in the thing and trying to rob somebody. And they saw a guy walking, so they ran towards him. Obviously they didn't know he was Jewish. So the minute they saw he was Jewish, the guy started, um, you know, uh, shaking. And he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you're Jewish. Please forgive me. I would never do that to a Jewish man. So the Gaba didn't know, are they like 
making fun of him? Is it for real? Here they figure out he's a Jew and they are trying to tell him sorry, or they're going to now kill him because they realize he's Jewish, never mind his money. So he was like shocked, and then they continued speaking. And the two robbers told him, you have to understand that we are two prisoners that we got freed from prison. We have no money, we have nothing. We don't know how to live a normal life. Even when we were in jail, we were like always, we were criminals. And now we are out, but we don't know how to work, where to go, what to do. So we decided to continue. And that's why we wanted to rob. We saw a person wanted to rob you. But when we were in jail, there was a Jewish man with us in jail. He was a very nice man. And the Chabad rabbi used to always come and visit him. They did not know it was a Chabad rabbi. The guy later found out who it was, but they said the rabbi used to come and visit them. And he would bring them food. He would bring him food and, and so on and so forth. And the Jewish man that was with us in jail, he was such a nice man that the food really was for him, but he would share it with us. He would share it with other people because we didn't get any visitors. And he would always have this rabbi that wasn't really his relative. He would just come and visit him and talk to him and learn with him and bring him food. And, and since then that this man that was in jail, he was such a nice man. I don't know why he was in jail therefore, but he behaved with us so nicely and so royal and, and, and always shared everything he had and so on and so forth. We decided that we're never going to hurt any Jewish man. So now the Gaba is listening and he doesn't know, this Jewish man is listening, he doesn't know, is it real, is it not real? And he was so thankful to Hashem that he was saved. So he felt so bad on, the, on these two robbers, obviously they were not Jewish people. He told him, you know, I really want you to start living a normal life. I'm going to go, I'm going to take out money. He gave them a big sum of money so they can start living a normal life. And all of this, why did it happen? Because this Chabad rabbi was going to jail to visit Jewish prisoners. And he happened to visit the Jewish prisoners that were in the same place, this Jewish prisoner with those two robbers. And because of that, first of all, they've learned this Jewish prisoner, I'm sure, became a better person. They have learned to understand that you have to be nice to Eden, that Eden are special people. And this man that used to watch the shul, you know, was saved and so on and so forth. I think just an amazing story. And I wanted to share it. I read it. I was really um, uplifted, inspired, because so many times we do so many wonderful things. We do so many mitzvot. We help. We share not just with Jewish people, with anybody, because we are the ones to bring light to the world. We have to be a light to the nations. And you give to somebody your seat in, in, in the bus, in the seat train, you meet a, a, you know, a beggar, you give them, doesn't matter what their nationality, what the color and so on and so forth. And many times you think, okay, I've done one thing. I don't realize many times how wonderful it is, how it goes, how it grows, and how many more people can benefit from it, and so on and so forth. I just remember the story, a true story that happened, either it was last year, two years ago, maybe you'll remember, I think it was two years ago, it went viral, because there was a video of it on the sea train in New York. A Chabad rabbi that came uh, to the Rebbe for the Kino Sashluchim, for the um, big, um, you know, um, how should I say? Um, um, I don't know what's happening lately. I'm forgetting the words. He knows the, the um, convention. And he went, after the convention, he went to Manhattan, whatever, to buy shoes. And he was sitting in the, um, in the, in the train, in the, what's not called Citroen, whatever, in the, how do they call it in New York? In the train underneath the, you know, it goes like under, underground. And um, he was sitting next to an um, African-American gentleman was sitting next to him and he had no shoes. He was barefoot. So the rabbi asked him, the rabbi from Argentina, the rabbi asked him, why aren't you wearing shoes? 
He says, I don't have any shoes. So the rabbi felt so sorry for him and he thought to himself, I just bought another pair of shoes. So now I have two shoes. This gentleman doesn't even have one pair of shoes. So he took the shoes and he gave it to the man. And it's amazing because you see it. The story went viral later, but it was all recorded because I guess in the trains in New York, you have, um, you know, they have cameras all the time because there can be a lot of crime there as well, especially at night and it's dark. And it's, I went there many times. It's really scary, especially the train stops and it's dark and you cannot see anything. And there's a lot of very interesting elements there. And it can be really scary, especially for a girl. I mean, I didn't go myself, I used to go with friends, but still it wasn't fun in those few moments that the train would stop or something like that. So they have, I guess, security and you can see in the thing, how they talking and, and then he's giving me the shoes and the black man was so excited. He couldn't believe it, that somebody will have so much kindness, so much love. He doesn't know him, he doesn't know who he is, nothing. He just gave him a new pair of shoes because he wanted to share with him and it wasn't even the same religion and they didn't even have the same color. You know, they were so, so different, but he's a human being, he's a human being and he decided to share. And that mitzvah made, so many more mitzvahs because people were so impressed to see a Jewish rabbi without thinking, giving a pair of shoes to a black man who didn't have shoes, which teaches us that we have to help everyone. And here with this story here, the rabbi went to visit people in, in jail. How many times we go now? My husband used to go a lot of times. I mean, all the years now, Rabbi Levi, our son is going. You go and you think, yeah, big deal, but you're helping them, you're doing, it's a lot of hours to go all the way to uh, to Bowdoin and come back and whatever and get permits. It's everything takes time, but every good thing that we do goes a long way. Girls, I'll just ask you for one take, second, I have to turn off the oven, I'm sorry. Okay. You know, I, I wanted to turn it off before the class. I said, no, I'll leave it another few minutes. I'll get a little bit burned, but it's okay. The chicken will taste good. <laughs> Rabbi Tzach Martin said, some, uh, said another, uh, also a story that I want to share with you. Amazing story. A guy by the name Moti El Malam they live in Israel. That's what happened in Israel. The other one was in Paris. Um, he got up early in the morning, as usual. And he's looking around, you know, in the, in the front room. And he doesn't understand why the chair is upside down. And then he sees, like, the clothes are, you know, all over the room on the floor. And then he goes, what's going on? Was somebody here at night? Somebody visit the house? Was there a thief in the house? So the first thing he ran to the children's room. Such a scary feeling, God forbid. And he said, Baruch Hashem, thank God, the children are sleeping. It was really early. Children are all sleeping in bed. Baruch Hashem. And then he started looking around more and he sees that something is, for sure somebody was in the house. Although nobody stole the, all the, like the computers and the, that stuff is there. And then he says, uh, he went back to his bedroom and he started touching, you know, like feeling his clothing. And he says, oi, the wallet is not here. Wow, the wallet and the car keys are not here. Wow, the car. Sorry. Shlaimala? Hi, Mamala. Shlaimala? Yeah. Um, I know you just came from the bar mitzvah. I'm in the middle of uh I'm in the middle of a conversation. Are you already in bed? 
Are you getting ready? Was was me clean and normal? Call me in fifteen minutes. You're gonna be ready before that in bed. I'll try. Yeah. Geishlafen, though. Geishlafen. Okay. Okay. I love you. Don't wait for me. I'm back. Oi, Givalt is, is, is right. Uh, anyway, he ran, he got so scared. He ran to the window and then he almost fainted because he saw that the parking spot was empty, which means the thieves took the wallet and they took the keys and they drove away with the car. Moti felt that the heavens fell on his head. He was never as broken before. He started crying. And meanwhile, his wife woke up. And she realized what happened as well. And he says he can't believe it. Even now, the person who writes the story says that it's so much after that, so long after the story, he still starts shaking when he thinks about those difficult moments. He worked for so many years in order to be able to get enough money. And it's not easy in Israel. It's not easy nowhere, but you know, in Israel, it's not easy to be able to buy the vehicle. It was a, it was a vehicle. It doesn't say that it was, I don't know if it was a Jeep or a, not a Jeep, but it was a, a vehicle for work. It was a big van, I guess. And he just bought it a few days ago. And he put in that vehicle all his uh, machinery that he used to work for, which costed tens of thousands of shekels. And he bought it with money that he saved for many long years that he had worked. And he just bought it now. He just started with a car that he didn't even have a chance to buy insurance. Like the most scary thing, like how much worse can it get? I mean, Baruch Hashem, but it's gizund, you know, but a new car, all the things inside a few days ago, and there was not even insurance on it. I thought people don't let you get a car till you have insurance, maybe a house, but anyway, when the bank doesn't let you give you a mortgage unless you get insurance, but I guess if you pay by cash, they don't care probably. But anyway, for a long hour, he was frozen. He did not know what to do. He knows that it's so often, unfortunately, people um, steal cars. And we have to be very grateful that we are okay. I do want to share with you what happened to me yesterday. I was at home. My car is parked on the street. And all of a sudden, somebody's coming to knock, a beautiful lady, like a neighbor. I said, who is it? She goes, it's a neighbor. Somebody hurt your car. I said, what? I ran out and she said she heard a noise and she went to look. She was outside, but the car ran away. It was a, a pickup truck. He drove so quickly. I don't know why he drove so close to my car that he broke the, the mirror, but big times. Just the mirror itself to buy it is $300. We found out today. And then we need to, hopefully somebody will do it to that money. Couldn't believe it. It was like it laid on the floor. He broke the whole thing. She said he stopped, he stalled, and he continued. I don't believe that he did it on purpose because she didn't say he drove slowly and then. So I guess, yeah. Baruch Hashem, we are okay. Baruch Hashem. Just thinking about cars. So now I cannot drive it because it doesn't have a... Um, to TV to discuss. I know, I don't know to discuss their plight and people are good. I, I don't know how to find out who did it. I don't know who has a camera that will catch it, but I don't know, we'll have to see, speak to some of the, of the neighbors. And then he started thinking what's gonna be, what's gonna be, and he started thinking in his head, think positive, think good, think good, it will be good. You know how we were speaking now, that's why I decided also to share the story. Think good, it will be good. It was just something that I was just learning lately. And he was telling himself, Moti, think good, it will be good. Don't lose hope. And this funny slogan he's saying, 
all of a sudden came in his head just a few days before when he wanted, when he bought the, this big van for his work, he wanted to uh, paint it and like, you know, uh, put whatever he was selling, whatever he was doing. So he came into a, another um, a shop and he asked them if they can help him put something on it. And as he, as he was coming into the shop, Rabbi Dekel, Rabbi Noam, a man by the name Rabbi Noam Dekel, the Rebbe Shliach to that city, Yaknaam, everybody loves him and he's a nice guy. So as he was going to the shop, he met the Rabbi and he said, Rabbi, I'm going to paint you know, my company, whatever I do on my van. What do you think I should put on it? And the rabbi told him, and he says, maybe there is something that I can put on it that's going to uh, give me more bracha, more blessing, more, you know, happiness and success. So the rabbi told him, sure, you know, you should put in your car. And this is something actually girls that we should all know to have in our car, um, a tzedakah box, and a chitat, a chumash, a tanya, a tilim, you know, something holy, then our car becomes a vehicle to something holy. So we have more blessing in the car. So he, and then the rabbi told him, and what are you going to write on the car? You should write something that it makes your car become a vehicle to something holy, not just putting in the car, but write something else on it. Yeah, this is cute to have the Star of David. This is good, but it's good to have something more um, also a holy object, you know, like um, a tzedakah box becomes a holy object because you do a mitzvah with it. The money is not holy, but every time you go to the car, you remember you give tzedakah, then it's good or a prayer book or so. Yes, very nice. So the rabbi told you, you know what you should write? You should write, Hineze Mashiach Ba, what the rabbi said here, Mashiach is coming. It's in Israel, right? So you write it in Hebrew. Hineze Mashiach Ba on one side. And on the other side, you should write Hashof Tov Iyeto. Think good, think positive, it will be good. And this guy Moti was a very nice man. He was not a religious man per se, but he decided that he will um, that he liked that. And he will put it on his uh, on his car. And he got very um, attached to the words, think good, it will be good. So that's what he was thinking now. And he's thinking all the time, it will be good, it will be good, it will be good. But then when he looks at the window, out the window, and he looks at his parking spot and it's empty, he started again, you know, getting upset. And, 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 and it's back and forth, back and forth, trying with his head to think positive, And it's not easy, but he is becoming more and more positive that Hashem will help him. Remember, it happened early in the morning. It's already 11 o'clock. In the morning, like he woke up early, so maybe it was five or six o'clock, and that's already eleven o'clock. All this time they are thinking, talking, and so on and so on. They don't know what to do. All of a sudden, the phone is ringing in the house, and um, who is calling? Somebody from the um, police service from Tachana, uh, from a from a place in in Israel, and they tell him, "Are you, is your name Moti Al Malam?" He's saying it in a very you know, stern voice. And um, did somebody steal your vehicle at night? Do you want to come and collect and pick it up? But he couldn't believe it. His heart stopped to beat. He thought that probably somebody is making fun of him. Somebody was stealing such a car with so much stuff. <laughs> They're not going to find it like this. And, and the police is telling him to come and pick it up. Like, how did the police get a hold of it? Like, he thought that for sure somebody's making fun of him. But his brother that was there that came to help him and just make him feel better, you know, he told him, you know what? Let's go try. Let's see if it's a prank or not. Let's go to that police station. Let's see. So they took the car, his brother's car, and they went there and took them two hours to get there. Finally, when they get, they got there, Moti was rubbing his eyes. He's standing outside and he sees from far his vehicle and his vehicle is not broken. 
and then they went, obviously didn't go to the vehicle. He went to the police station to ask him lots of questions and so on and so forth. And then one of the um, policemen um, told that he lately he became, um, he became lately also started keeping a little bit of Torah and mitzvot. His name was Yossi. And Yossi went, you know, uh, tapped the shoulder of Moti and he says, you should know that you are a very lucky man. Come, I have to show you your car. Obviously they found the car because of registration, everything, they had his name and phone number and so on. That's how the police called him. He says, you know how we found your car? You are amazing. The words that you wrote on your car, you wrote in big, in red letters, you wrote, Hineze Mashiach Ba, here Mashiach is coming. What happened? Listen, girls, see how Hashem watched him and how because he wrote on his vehicle, he made his vehicle a holy place. Because he wrote on his vehicle, it was a big vehicle, not just a regular car, right? Like a big uh, van that has a lot of um, uh, equipment in it. Comes. So Yossi is saying, I am a policeman. And last night I was standing in the Shomron and looking at all the cars that are going by. This is my job to make sure that God forbid, God forbid that they no, no, no suspicious vehicles, suspicious people go in and so on. God forbid to hurt the Jewish people. And we were all uh, looking. A lot, a lot of cars. Usually he says, we don't start chasing after a vehicle that is a stolen vehicle. We can't. We, we, we chase after if we think somebody is uh, unfortunately a, a, a terrorist because we must make sure that everybody is safe. So as bad as it is, that somebody steals a vehicle, if we suspect that somebody stole a vehicle, usually we don't chase. Probably so many stolen vehicles, unfortunately, I'm not sure. But he's saying just because... We have to make sure that people are safe and we pay attention to that. But then all of a sudden we see this big van. The ordinary plants looks like it, it's a van. It's a van that looks like it's not passenger van, right? It's for work. And then it says on it, Here Mashiach is coming. Is cool to and then I see that the this van, there's no problem. It says the name Mashiach Ba, but then I see that the van is going slowly. Girls, can you, can you put, uh, can you mute yourself? Along a unique path that mimics the state of matter, typically uh, found in extreme cold condition. Uh, Remarkably, plants the, are performing this Then do you want to mute yourself? Maybe it's come from you. I don't know from who, but unless it's something my car talking. No, I, sorry about that. Yeah. He sees the policeman is saying it's okay that the car that says it was Moshiach Ba is going towards Shechem. Well, you know, Shechem is the city of it's, it's, it's a Muslim city, it's an Arab city. So he says, I right away understood that something is wrong because here is a vehicle that looks like a, a, a vehicle that has merchandise that is not a that is from a business vehicle, as we say, but something is um, not right about it. It's suspicious. It's a suspicious vehicle that says on it, speaks about Moshiach, and they're going to Shechem, like something is wrong. So he right away told all the policemen around that they should quickly run after, you know, drive after this vehicle, and they should put a machsom. They should block the vehicle so it cannot continue to go into that our village, the thief that was driving the vehicle got so scared because he realized that, that so many policemen are running after him. So he went to the side of the road, ran out of the car and went inside the orchard, not all the trees and ran away. And by the time the police came, he wasn't there anymore. The police obviously right away, took the vehicle, brought it to their place. 
And that's how they called him. Could you imagine? Could you imagine the, the big miracle that happened? If nothing would be written on it, if, the, if, if it wouldn't be written on it in Ezra Moshiach Ba, they would not run after it. Look at the miracle gets even bigger. Amazing. Yossi, the policeman, opens the vehicle and on the chair, on the seat of the driver, on the driver's seat, there is a long, very um, sharp knife. So the policeman tells Moti, does this belong to you? He asked him in a stern voice. And Moti started shaking. He said, obviously not. Only then Moti realized even more what a big miracle happened to him. Because when that terrible terrorist, thief, that came to his house in the middle of the night and stole the stuff, stole the car keys and the wallet, he came in with a knife. What a miracle that none of the children woke up, that he didn't wake up, that his wife didn't wake up because then he would want to protect himself, but God forbid, what would he have done with that long, sharp knife? Sorry, girl, just one more minute. Yeah, it's given good. It's given good. Yeah, good. Uh, I'll, I'll even speak, okay? Not so many. Okay? So we're, we're going to try to finish soon because I would like to speak a few minutes with him. He came very late because <laughs> they had a bar mitzvah. Anyway, girls, it's an amazing, amazing story. He realized what a amazing miracle happened to him that they were all slept and so on. As I said, thank God, thank God, thank God. Moti finally woke up. He came home. He felt that he got back all his money, everything that he owned, basically was in that car. And he really wanted to think, to thank Hashem for it. He didn't know what to do. So he spoke with his wife and said, you know, they spoke with the rabbi. They said they must start do something to thank Hashem. So Rav Dekel, the one that told him to write in Emoshiach Ba and think it will be good, he told him, you know what you should start doing? You should start to keep Shabbos. And the first Shabbat that they kept, he didn't go to work. He didn't drive. He stayed home with his four children, with his wife. It was so nice. And he was so beautiful. They never did Shabbat before. And he was so calm. And he loved it. He all of a sudden realized what a beautiful treasure he has with his family. What a beautiful treasure he has in his house that he can have every Shabbos. What beautiful traditions, everything that he has, and he never kept it. And then on Sunday, the children came over and they said, Abba, Father, will there be another time of Shabbat? The children didn't even know of such a thing that Shabbos is every week. They just thought, okay, they did one time and they laughed so much and they had so much attention from their parents and just being with them and spending the time and the holiness of the Shabbos candles and everything that they wanted to know if they're going to have another Shabbat or it was just a one-time thing. And he's saying that six months had passed by since and it's just amazing how they he continued obviously keeping Shabbos and he grew up more in Torah and mitzvot and we should all be as lucky girls. We, Hashem should save us. So many times things can happen and they don't happen. Hashem is saving us. We just don't realize many times what we have. We should have a good Shabbos. I'm finishing the class today a little bit earlier. We should have a good Shabbos. We should be strong. It is a goosebump story for sure. We should be strong with our head. We should do the right um, decisions. Be above 
you know, somebody speaking Lashon Hara, somebody speaking gossip, somebody's fighting. Let's not join that conversation. Let's not be petty. Let's be with our head up. And so lift up our head, do the right thing, walk with our head up, not in a way of being, oh, I'm better than somebody else, but just let's see the heaven. Let's not look at the bottom and the physical things. Let's look at the godly things and look at this gentleman here. Just because he wrote something so special, what a miracle happened to him. And we should all be saved. We should all be well. We should all be uh, protected in Israel, in the diaspora. And we should have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos. Thank you so much for joining.